Hello everybody, what is up? Hopefully your quarantine is still going all right. Mine's not going too bad. However, I'm not gonna lie. This is not my final form in terms of my little setup, you know? This shit is just kind of in the way and it's kind of bothering me. But bear with me here, okay? And if there's any sort of weird blots, just bear with me, okay? I'm still waiting for my actual tech that I had ordered to come so I can get the bombest, dankest setup you've ever seen. Now, story today, a little story time. <laughs> I was thinking about doing something a little lighthearted, and I was like, you know what? Let's talk about my experiences with suicide bombers. <laughs> so, no shit, there I was, 20 years old. I was like, you know what? Screw it. Let's go ahead and let's go study in Israel in a place called Tel Aviv University. Now, in at that time, 2015, there was a war that broke out right as I got there, and so... I studied international security over there, and so my happy self, oh, and, and Hebrew as well. So I was studying there, Israel, Palestinian areas, and in parts of Syria as well, which funny story with that one too. If I have a picture, I'll post it like right here, right now, but essentially I almost fell into a minefield and I met with some UN guys and weird little weird story with that. But anyway, let's focus on the suicide bombers for the moment. Okay. Now, <laughs> I'm laughing because this is so stupid. <laughs> when I was there, it was a weird feeling more towards the end of the summer. So there was something called a third intifada or uprising or knife intifada or, you know, knife in, in uprising. You get the point, right? There was an uprising in 2015 in September, which is right. I, I think I was there for about three months up to that point. And so it's a weird situation because of the fact that I was really good at getting into the wrong places at the wrong times. So the places that had the most issues were Ebron, I was there, Bet Shemesh, which is near Jerusalem, there, Jerusalem, I was there. I didn't really see anything until I went to Jerusalem, and then that was very problematic. And then I was in, uh, I was at Tel Aviv as well. So overall, I was pretty much in the worst places at the worst time. Now, it's what the weird part about this, though, it was that, you know, there are certain times I feel like we all have in life where there's two people who are about to fight and you kind of get the vibe. You're like, Oh, something's about to go down. Holy shit. Like I just saw one and I'm actually not kidding on this. I actually saw that situation yesterday in a Walmart parking lot, which was, um, that was on par with what I imagined. But anyway, when I was walking around one, once upon a time, I was in the markets in Israel and I was with two Israeli soldiers. They weren't dressed up. They were speaking English. They had a parent from the United States. And so they, their English sounded like mine. But when we were walking through this market, it was real wild because of the fact that they were speaking English, but yet the people there knew that they were soldiers. And there was no way for them to know. They didn't recognize them. They, I guess there was just it was something about their mannerisms. And so when we were walking, even though I was American, I was like, they're probably going to like just hate me. No, they didn't. They actually liked me, not because of me, um, especially considering the fact that I looked like I literally was dressed pretty much the way that I, I am now. It's just the fact that I guess they didn't really mind Americans too much at that moment. Granted, a lot of shit has changed since 2015. So we're walking around. And the minute we walked into the more, uh, like the Arabic speaking sections, they look at the Israeli soldiers and they're like, no, you go. Just like that. And it was the weirdest thing because I was like, uh, what? And I look at them and they look through me. They don't even care that I'm there. And they look at the, the soldiers and they're like, no, you go. You have to go. We don't want you here. Go. And it was the weirdest thing because stuff like that happens here and there. But this was like a different level of shit. This was like, okay, not only is stuff about to go down, but I feel like everybody's going to get, someone's going to get stabbed or shot or something. And then the next day, everything just went downhill from there. And also there's like missile strikes coming in too, which I experienced, which is a really weird feeling, by the way, um, because... You know, it's it's kind of like, have you ever seen a kid fall and they stop and they kind of look around and look around the room like, okay, is anybody going to say anything? Nope, nobody's reacting. And then they just kind of resume whatever it is that they're doing. That's essentially what it was like. I was like, oh God, here comes the missiles. I might die. I'm going to film this in case, you know, I die. Maybe the camera will survive some miraculous way and people know how I die. It was weird because nobody really batted an eye to this type of stuff. So I was like, holy shit, here it comes. Oh my God. And I'm freaking out, but nobody's batting an eye. So I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, this is cool. We good? Everything's fine? Okay, well, all right, well, there's that then. So what was fascinating about the situation though was that I decided to 
kind of tweak my area of study a little bit as a result of this. And I started to focus on what are the motivations for people to become suicide bombers? Now, the reason why I actually started to ask these very questions was just because of the fact that if you were understanding what motivates somebody to to commit suicide, to kill somebody, you probably will have a better understanding of the issues at large, like all the different types of factors going on there. So when I was there, I actually asked some of them too, just out of my own curiosity, I started asking some of the people in the areas that were getting attacked. Hey, why are you attacking? What's going on? What is upsetting you? What are the main things that are pissing you off? And I just had these blatant conversations with them. And then I realized, holy shit, this this is something that isn't really discussed too much. What motivates somebody to do this? And then, of course, got through the buildings with the... This was mostly in northern Israel, Syria area. You know, the, the buildings with the bullet holes and the blood and the explosions and all that other stuff. So I got, I got a feeling with that. Now, to kind of like make this a lot more succinct and so I don't go on a full-blown rant... Um, I wrote my honors thesis, which I have all my sources and the thesis in the description box below, but essentially I wrote my thesis on the motivations or the potential motivations for why Palestinians are utilizing suicide bombings in order to understand the larger picture that we have today. And so with pretty much what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about this from an intellectual perspective, I have my little notes, and then I want to talk about this from a personal perspective as well. So number one is you have primary and secondary factors. That's kind of the way that I had listed it. Uh, for primary factors, you have occupation and Hamas. Now, you might be thinking, well, no shit. Like, obviously, occupation is going to be on there. Well, you know, that's actually kind of a, a debatable topic because even in the United States, they're like, well, no, I mean, you take over the country and then you hamper down their potential ability to be able to mobilize and their ability to collect resources to commit these suicide bombings. No, no, it's it's bullshit, actually. That, in theory, is a is a good idea hypothetically, maybe, I don't know. No. Now, I'm not saying also that the Palestinians are totally not to blame because, well, they're this, they're suicide bombers, right? Enough said. I'm just telling you these are the motivations. So first of all, let's look at the period between 2000 and 2005. Uh, for occupation, I mean, you have, you know, Prime Minister Barak, who increased Jewish-only settlements, and then there are suicide bombings right afterwards. And these are the things that I found. And these things aren't even really talked about too often, even in the, the research. I was like, yo, is nobody going to be talking about this type of stuff? And then 2001, you have the Israeli occupation, the worst occupation policy since 1993, and then more suicide bombings after that. Um, 30,000 Palestinians in Ebron, which is where I was also at, were under 24-hour curfew, more suicide bombings after that. 2002 Operation Defensive uh, Defensive Shield, and then more suicide bombings after that. Uh, so that was pretty fascinating. And keep in mind too that with this type of curfew, uh, they even have like to go to work. You have to wait sometimes an, uh, two hours just to go to work. You have to wait in line. Keep in mind in the summer it's 125 degrees in the middle of the desert. Doesn't sound that fun, does it? Now Hamas. One of the things that I realized about Hamas was that not only were they able to promote the attacks, but supply the resources and fund them as well. Now, Hamas is one out of like a dozen organizations in that area. However, Hamas accounted for 40% of the total amount of suicide attacks, which is pretty wild. I mean, that's why they started gaining popularity. And so when we're talking about the psychology behind individuals committing suicide attacks, we're looking at individuals who most of the time they were there. Sometimes I think it was up in certain areas like Rafa. There was what 1,400 people who lost their home for the second and third time. We're talking about an area where the water, I think it's 93% of the water is undrinkable. You have 90% of the exports have to go through Israel. You have what is that? 70%, I believe it's 70% of the imports go through Israel. And so when Israel feels that it's necessary, they'll start to restrict their ability to be able to get food. In addition to that too, you have 90% of the Palestinian population only consuming 60% of the food. And then, so then they have to survive off of the land, but then Israel burns the land that they're trying to survive off of. And so when we're having these conversations, you have to think about it this way. A lot of the Palestinians, they realize that, not realize, but like they think, some of them, that they can't, literally can't support their families and their kids are going to die. That's what it comes down to. 
So when we're talking about Hamas, what happens is Hamas is able to supply them with the tax. And generally, you have something called tangible and intangible returns. So tangible returns are like money, so they get paid. And there's a debate on how much they get paid because it's hard to kind of confirm the exact amount. But yes, they do, in fact, get paid. Again, all my sources are in the description box below, like my honors thesis, and then I attach like whatever it is, 180 citations, something like that. But uh, they get paid, and then from that point onwards, their kids are able to survive. And when you're there, you also realize that the people there are living in shacks a lot of the time, like literally like scrap metal combined together in 125 degree weather with no water and no food and no ability to be able to challenge Israel and bring Israel back to the 1947 lines that we all agreed internationally should be Israel's borders, but Israel expanded those borders. And keep in mind, the intangible returns are things like honor and honor system. So people's lives will get easier in the village because they're, the villagers view that person's family member who committed the suicide attack as like an honorable attack. And so as a result, their lives get substantially easier. They get respect. They get more food, things along those lines. So occupation and Tomas, dominant reasons. Next, we have political powerlessness. Now, this is the secondary motivations. These are like the smaller ones that kind of weave in and out. This is something that I think you guys would find to be very interesting, actually. So when I was researching this, I was like, hold on a second. How the fuck am I supposed to, how am I supposed to break this down? Because there's just so much going on and there's so much information, all this other crazy stuff. And then also, what did I experience myself? Well, when I was there, the po political powerlessness, that was, that could be seen in two different ways. You have government level and then you have the grassroots level. So government level. They literally can't do anything to change the situation. Now, granted, sometimes they had disrupted the, the political organizations, disrupted the peacemaking process, or excuse me, the Islamist extremist organizations disrupted the peacemaking process between the Palestinian government and the Israeli government. So well, that's a little tangent. But anyway, government level. I mean, you have Camp David two talks in 2000s. Didn't work out. You have something called Sharon's Walk in 2001, where the Palestinians realized that they couldn't negotiate with the Israeli prime minister, especially because this dude walked into the Al-Aqsa mosque, which is like a highly coveted big deal to them. It's a big mosque. And he like walked in and said he'll own it. So they realized they can't negotiate with this guy. And in addition to that too, 2003, the Arab League sponsored by Saudi Arabia said we will acknowledge Israel's right to exist if they decide to go back to what the lines that they that, that we all agreed on in 1947, Israel didn't take it either. Now, in terms of grassroots movements, this is where it gets pretty bad. And this is, I think this is where you guys are going to find, if you stuck with me this far, I think this is where you're going to be like, whoa, this is, this is even worse than I thought. So what happened was there, there were nonviolent protests that were tried in the early 2000s, and there was indiscriminate and excessive lethal force. And so Israel would just, a lot of the, the policies were literally just to shoot people, just, just shoot. And if you had cameras, there was videos of people who were just, they're just standing there filming. That's it. And they got shot in the face through the camera. You know, those sorts of things. And then there's something called broken bones policy, which I believe was the early 90s, where they literally would like bring like Palestinians' arms backwards. And then they would grab like rocks and then try to break their shoulders and break the sides of their knees or keep their elbows out and try to break the side of their elbow, things like that. That's the reality that they're dealing with. So if we're wondering why... Are they trying to do suicide attack? Which, by the way, suicide attacks are only 1% of the actual attacks initiated, but they account for, let me see if I have exact details. They account for 44% of the deaths. So if you're trying a peaceful protest, and you can. You're trying to support the family, you can't. You have an organization that says, hey, we'll give you money, we'll give you an opportunity. What are you going to do? As, what, what else are you going to do? Next, we have economics, right? People can't eat. Like I already said with the imports and exports, right? Israel controls the bulk of that as well. And then the unemployment rate, I mean, shit, the United States, we're talking about the unemployment rate potentially getting up to like 27%. Well, in the Palestinian areas, that's pretty good. It usually goes from 27 to 36%. So people can't work. So now they can't get food. Resources, like I said, with the water, you have the fact that they have subsistence farming in some areas, but they, they can't survive with that either. Israel also, they will stop the, their ability to be able to buy fertilizer, which will cut their crop load down uh, by 20 to 
So that's another thing they do. And then their land also is about 50% less. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Subsistence. I think that's the word I'm looking for. Subsistence. They get about 50% less. That's what I'm trying to say. When we're having a conversation about the suicide bombers, you got to keep that in mind because this is the reality that these people are living in. So let's continue here. Housing. I mean, literally $2.2 billion worth of damage from 2000 to 2004 and 16,000 Palestinians are homeless. So they can't have food, don't have a job. They're also homeless. In addition to that too, majority of them, let's see. Let's see if I have this little statistic on this too. 12 to 36% of households reported to have a family member arrested. And half of the suicide bombers had experienced IDF, which is the Israeli Defense Force, had experienced uh, force by the IDF against them. And so housing, housing is an issue. Humiliation. So for example, the broken bones policy. One really jacked up thing too, by the way, here's, an, here's, a, here's a good one. Not a good one, but like, you know, here's a wild one too. I didn't know this when I was walking around until somebody mentioned it to me. And then I started to look into Human Rights Watch because literally there's, there's Palestinians who are like, dude, check this out. Go to Human Rights Watch, look it up. And I was like, okay. So what I'm going to be telling you that this is the Israeli government versus Human Rights Watch. I'm just giving you guys the information, take with it, you know, what you will. But with humiliation, you were talking about they, they, the Israeli Defense Force, their military, they made Palestinians become human shields. So they will hold the Palestinians, and there's videos of this, and then literally walk with the Palestinians shooting other Palestinians, holding the Palestinian as a shield. In addition to that, they'll force Palestinians to conduct military operations against each other. So they'll walk in, grab a couple, like, you know, Palestinians, and they'll say, hey, come on, you're going to go do a mission. And then they force them to do a military mission against their own people. So then the Palestinians have to kill each other. Again, just, just another motivation. In addition to that too, you also have revenge, which is what I kind of already, you know, talked about up to this point. There's so many different things that you could say about this. And a wild one, here's, a, here's another wild one. There's literally something called the illegal combatants law, which says that the Israeli government can hold somebody indefinitely for an undefined amount of time based off of the assumption that they may have done something, not because they have evidence to convict this person of doing something. And so what happens is to get around their fair trial laws, they're able to renew that period. And so a lot of times they'll have prisons that are right on the Palestinian border. So it's like Israel, massive prison, and then the Palestinian area. So they have to look at this prison every single day. And when they look across and see this prison, they know that, look, you can be held there indefinitely for, you know, months, years. I mean, literally, what is it? 4,000 people were held there. Yeah, 4,000 people were held there indefinitely without being tried. Let's just keep that in mind. So I don't want to go on a full-blown, you know, rant, even though I pretty much have been going on a full-blown rant this whole time. But I felt like this was pretty important to have a conversation about, especially considering the fact that we're looking into you know, what's going on abroad and what's our foreign policy and like all this other crazy stuff, but we never really humanize this issue. For me, because of the fact that I would literally talk to the Palestinians and I was also there during a time of war. In addition to that, I also then studied it afterwards. I'm telling you guys right now, it's, it's so hard to put yourself in that position and understand the psychology unless you've physically been there and you know what the type of stuff that they've had to deal with. But I thought you guys would find this to be a little interesting regardless. And maybe this, you know, maybe you got something out of this because there's not really a lot of Americans that I've seen that talk about this from an academic and a first person perspective. Anyway, guys, thank you very much.